attention. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Um, those of you that are visiting from uh, another school, I think we have Casco Bay High School here as well as South Portland, but they may be coming in shortly. Just want to welcome you to Deering and all of our Deering students from various courses, um, human rights, global issues, some literature, drama and speech classes. Um, we want to welcome you uh, to this afternoon's <coughs> panel. Uh, we have a wonderful panel here who is going to shed some light, hopefully, and uh, help us think about uh, the world through their various lenses and in order to understand and investigate the world a bit more, recognize perspectives, and ultimately to take action. So to lead us through that, uh, we have Marianne Isaac, who is a senior here at Deering High School. and. Um, before I hand it over to Marianne, I just want to thank Raisa Jalali and uh, the whole crew at USM um, who helped organize this event. And so uh, Marianne Isaac will um, uh, introduce the prompt and go through a little bit what the program will look like and we'll be here until about 1.40. So thank you very much for being here and welcome to Deering High School. Yeah. Hi everyone, thank you for coming today. Um, and so we're going to have um, our panelists 20 minutes um, to answer this prompt and so the prompt for our speakers will be um, there are numerous and challenging and global or complex global issues that we face today in our future problems such as climate change food insecurity terrorism international and internal displacement of people income disparity and others what role has religion played in contributing to these and what role does at play in coming up with the solutions. What are positive stories of people taking action to cooperate and do good? Please help us leave um, inspired and hopeful so you guys can um, begin, and we can begin um, talking about what um, each religion has contributed to um, these issues in the world and what positive outcomes we can have. So 20 minutes um, for all of you guys, I guess. Throughout 20 minutes, you guys can speak on what you guys, so yeah. Okay, well, I guess I'll start. <laughs> so my name is David Sandmel. Uh, I'm a rabbi. Um, I actually was a rabbi here in Portland, Maine for five years. And um, both my children were born here. Um, I was telling that um, someone once said to me, I said, you know, I'm not really a real Mainer, but my kids were born here. And this old guy said, cat can have kittens in the oven, don't make them biscuits. So um, I thought that was kind of cold. But, you know. um, I have been involved in interfaith relations for uh, many years. I currently work for an organization called the Anti-Defamation League. Uh, the Anti-Defamation League was founded in 1913 with a dual mission to fight the defamation of the Jewish people and to secure justice and fair treatment for all. So it has both a very specific Jewish focus and a much broader uh, human family focus. <clears throat> we do a lot of work, and I will get to the prompt in just a moment, we do a lot of uh, 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 work in uh, civil rights. We've um, got folks in Washington, D.C. working on advocacy around uh, issues of, most recently, the restoration of the Voting Rights Act. So I don't know if people have been following that, uh, in um, uh, uh, pushing for fair immigration reform, uh, women's rights, uh, religious freedom, LGBTQ rights. These are all things that we're involved in. We also have an education program where we run, uh, we, we develop uh, curricula for um, schools. We have a program called No Place for Hate uh, and A World for Difference where we come in in schools and talk about what it means to live in a diverse society and to be involved with people who uh, come from other traditions or other parts of the world from where one comes from and how it is that we can all uh, 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 live together and live together to try to build better societies. So those are some of the things that my organization's involved in. I specifically um, uh, am engaged with other um, uh, religious institutions, um, 
and, and movements, Christian, Muslim, Hindu, Jain, uh, Buddhist, uh, the, kind of the whole spectrum, uh, both in, uh, specifically in terms of um, uh, how we can work together again in, in, the, the, in the American context, especially in the legislative context and so forth. So those are some of the kind of things that I'm uh, involved in, in addition to I guess what would be sort of a, 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 a given, which is the Jewish Christian uh, uh, relationship and dialogue as, as well. So, as to the prompt, let me just throw out a, a, a few things. Um, I think if you look at media today, news media today, uh, one of the things that uh, one can get the impression is that um, uh, religion is the source of many of the conflicts uh, in uh, our world. And um, I think that if you were to ask many people, you know, yet, uh, uh, is religion a positive or a, ben or, or a negative factor in the world? Many folks might actually say that it's a negative factor. And there's certainly, in my mind, uh, evidence to support that. Um, however, um, I think it's more complex than that, and I think that in many places, even where there is religious conflict, you find uh, people from religious communities working to, um, uh, working to bridge differences. Uh, people from, uh, uh, if you think about in the course of history, things like um, hospitals, universities, uh, all of these are things that, that initially came out of uh, a religious world. Um, the largest uh, charities in the world that seek to uh, bring relief to uh, people in war torn areas to do with refugees and so forth, these all tend to be religious charities. So the question really becomes how do those of us who identify with religious traditions um, galvanize the people within our own communities to uh, work in ways that bring solutions to some of the problems, even if those, some of those problems initially began within religious communities. Um, I would like to think that we're moving in a positive direction, um, but we live in a very complicated world. So let me pause there and throw it over to my colleagues. Echo. Well, 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 well. Thank you for having us. I'm happy. Uh, and I love you guys. You know, nothing gives me, I love you too. <laughs> nothing gives me more energy than being with students. So you remind me of my days when I was in high school. I wish I could go back, but my, um, my friends, I'm telling you, once you are up there, you cannot go down. <laughs> um, so I'm here because you inspire me. I'm here because you give me hope that tomorrow will be a better day than today. I do travel around the world to engage uh, different religious communities on issues I care about. And uh, when I sit with young women and men, with young girls and boys, I say, wait a minute, maybe we messed it up. They are going to fix it. Uh, who am I? I'm Imam Yahya Hindi. I'm the Muslim chaplain at Georgetown University. Georgetown became the first American university to hire an imam or a Muslim chaplain back in 1999. Uh, I am uh, uh, the president of an organization called Clergy Beyond Borders. It is made of rabbis, priests, pastors, and imams dedicated to peace building and conflict resolution. 
we have done trainings uh, and uh, organized seminars for the clergy, men and women, uh, in uh, uh, 13 countries and 17 U.S. states, in which we try to engage uh, people of faith and people of religion and spirituality on issues that we care about, the environment, uh, poverty, social justice, environmental justice, uh, gender justice as, as, as well. I'm also a member in the Islamic Jurisprudence Council of North America. This is the leading Muslim jurists council uh, made of 17 uh, senior imams who are in charge of, uh, or if you will, we answer religious questions that the community uh, sends to us. Now, what came to my mind when I read the statement is uh, a verse from the Holy Quran in chapter 49, verse 13. It says, O humankind, I, God, created you from a single pair of a male and a female and made you into nations and tribes that you may come to know one another, not that you may despise each other. For me, this is a rather important verse because it tells us that God intentionally created us different. God intentionally wanted us to be different, wanted us to be diverse and pluralistic. The challenge to us is how can we honor that diversity? How we can celebrate that diversity? And how we can protect that diversity? For me, religion is what religion does. Religion may do bad, may do good. Not because religion is bad or good, but because those who espouse that religion may use it for bad agenda or good agenda. The religion that gave birth to, to uh, Taliban and Boko Haram and Al-Shabaab, these terrorist organizations, has also given birth to the science of algebra and mathematics. Uh, uh, Muslims invented, according to historians, the concept of zero, on which the whole idea of computer science depends. So it's not religion, it's not Islam, it's what people make of Islam. It's what people make of Judaism or of Christianity. I think religion is a wonderful thing. Religion it brings us closer to God. Religion it brings us closer to one another. Religion inspires us to do more. Religion inspires us to take care of the poor, to take care of the needy. Religion inspires us to love one another. I live for a principle that shapes my life. Uh, how we can espouse a culture of passion for compassion. How, how we can, as people of faith, passionately engage in making our culture become a culture of passion for compassion, a, a culture that cares for the poor, a culture that shelters the homeless. And this is not an Islamic value only. It's a Jewish value. It's a Christian value. It's a biblical value. It's a Quranic value. A, 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 a religion does not do violence. It's the mindset that does violence. I say there is nothing called Islamic terrorism. Terrorism has no religion. There's nothing called the Christian terrorism or Jewish terrorism. Terrorism has no religion. It's an act of terrorism. And religion cannot espouse terrorism, cannot espouse violence. It is what we make of that, of that religion. Give you two specific examples. If you remember a few years ago that uh, pastor who wanted to burn the Quran and did burn the Quran, if you remember, in Florida. He did that in the name of the Bible. He did that in the name of the Christianity. My question, was that a Christianity? The answer is absolutely not. I participated in a, a conference and a gathering of 760 Christian leaders who gathered in Oak Ridge, Tennessee that weekend in a program called Burn a Candle, Not a Quran. That's Christianity. How we can come together to protect one another. So that little person 
Though he claimed to have spoken for the Bible, he did not speak for, 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 for the Bible. You know, so are Muslims. We have these crazy nuts, sorry for the language, and they are crazy nuts, you know, who are acting in the name of Islam, Boko Haram, you know, in, 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 in uh, Nigeria, or the terrorists, uh, Daesh or ISIS or ISIL, who are burning people alive. Is that Islam? Absolutely not. Many of the Christians in Iraq and Syria now are protected because there are Muslims who are saying not in the name of Islam and have financially contributed to the protection of the Christians of the Middle East. I myself a year ago, a year and a half ago, led an American delegation called American Muslims for the protection of the Christians of the Middle East. And we understood that to be our religious uh, uh, mandate as Muslims to ensure that the Middle East is not only for Muslims, but rather for Christians as well. And our, auto, uh, our motto was, the birthplace of Jesus cannot be empty from the followers of Jesus. Here you have Muslims speaking for the protection and for the care of Christians. This is for me the religious mandate to all of us, how we can become a voice for peace, a voice for dialogue, not only for ourselves, but for also for each other. Thank you. It's a great pleasure for me to be here as well today. I'm Arthur Kennedy. I'm a bishop from the uh, Diocese of Boston. And um, I'm delighted to be here at your high school guys, because I have a great fondness for the uh, school that I went to in Boston, Boston Latin School. It's the oldest school in the United States, 1635. And as the Beach Boys sang in one of their songs, be good to your school. It's important because a school is a place where you have the opening up of uh, questions, of intelligence, of the shaping of imagination, of the capacity to begin to think out what it is going to be for you to make the decisions necessary in order to participate as you would like to in a world that so increasingly needs people of wisdom to begin to enter into discussions and transformations. I think that what we have heard um, already here this afternoon speaks very profoundly about the way in which the, the question of religion lives within the context of all of these other concerns that come up in our, in our world, in our personal lives, in our communities, and the way in which we begin to comprehend the enormous traditions uh, that lie behind the, the, the religions that are represented here today. These traditions are manifestations of the enormous uh, development of attention to both God and humanity. They are concerned always to be able to know how does one find oneself in a particular order? How does one participate in a way that not only supports an order that allows authentic civilization to come forward, because religion is concerned about authentic civilization being part of the way in which ordinary people live their ordinary lives, their workaday world the times in which they care for their families, the times in which they play their sports, all of these elements that are part of a world that is connected with so many different things of which humans are capable and which we are able to enjoy. And the way in which we become together in a, in a school such as this or the other schools who are represented here today is very important in the sense of one of the things that is at the core of authentic religious life. And that is the development of friendships. Amicizia is the Latin word for the friendships. This is one of the great manifestations that allows people to begin to share common meanings. And these common meanings are able to be generated out of interests that you all 
have together. And the important thing about friendships is they transcend differences. And friends become those who are not just happening to be living together, but rather they are people who care for one another. So there is a natural virtue that is a part of what religion wants to be able to identify and to support. And when also you become engaged in this matter of the, the development of friendships, you also have to raise the question that religion puts forward about the friendship with God. This is a very, very important way in which we come to understand religious meanings. That there is a divine friend, uh, and that friend is one who cares watches over, has providence. And as we were listening to both the rabbi and the imam this earlier, what we hear is that underlying the issue of religious life, religious faith, religious worship, there is also a common sense of the experience of God. And that experience awakens for us a, a divine order in which the world is to be shaped so as to fulfill the divine plan. This is something we know in all of our traditions, all of us who are here. In Catholicism and Christianity in general, there have been enormous numbers of contributions as well as problems that have developed because of the way in which traditions struggle to identify themselves so as to be faithful to what they are called to be. The rabbi was mentioning to us about the important things that have been created because of religions, hospitals, educations, universities, all of the uh, charities that exist for people, but also in the knowledge and wisdom that comes within all of our traditions a way in which we are able to recognize that the, that the fundamentals underlying what is the common human experience reveals to us a certain, a certain universal dynamism in all of our hearts and minds. And that is one of the things that the religious tradition seeks to foster. That way in which the opening of our hearts and minds to the truth about our existence in the world, and what is our ultimate purpose and calling in this world. In Catholic tradition, for example, often there have been times when members of the church, theologians, popes, different other social thinkers and so forth, have raised questions about how the church needs to be able to be aware of how to learn. We're celebrating this year this, this month, in fact, the 50th anniversary of the council that was held in the Vatican in Rome in 1960, from 62 to 65. And in those years, one of the things that happened in Catholicism was this effort to listen to what the world is saying, to enter into dialogue with the world, and to enter into dialogue with people of other religious traditions and other religious faiths. And so we had created a, a document that was specifically, specifically ordered to help us to think about what is our relationship with the Jewish and Muslim people, but also with Buddhists and Hindus and so forth. How is it that we are able to participate and to learn, to learn from them the way in which their sense of mystery, their way of facing up to the realities of one of the most frightening mysteries that we face, which we could give it many different names, but it's the mystery of evil. Because evil has the capacity to annihilate every good and to destroy every person. And so therefore, we need to have this kind of dialogue which allows us to be able to understand how together we are called to be able to uh, respond in ways in which with different gifts we have, uh, we have been placed in a certain specific moment in history. 
So what, one other example in which, uh, in, in the Catholic Church, where the question has come up recently on the matter of the environment. Of course, Benedict XVI began to talk about this during his time in the papacy beginning in 2005. And of course, um, new Pope, Pope Francis, has just issued a major letter on the environment and weather change and so forth. These are things that we need to be attentive to. They're, they're a universal part of our created ex common existence. And then also in the 19th century, when questions began to arise within the general culture about economies, what is a just economy? And so the, the church leaders began to think about what is a fair wage? How does one begin to think about the way in which work is so necessary for people to have a kind of dignity in their lives? And, and the way in which we have to think about politics in relationship to economies. These are big questions. And we are only partially through the way of beginning to see all the elements in there. But religious questions always open up to these questions as well. Because it is the way in which we see things ultimately that allows us to see things concretely, historically, personally. So we look forward, I think all of us, to what will be for you the contribution that you will be able to make in your lives. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for um, inputting how each religion kind of um, puts aspects of the world challenges that we have and how to make it a positive thing. So um, now we're going to open questions to the audience um, to ask our panelists. So if you guys prepared any questions in any of your classes, you um, can ask it at this time. So any questions? You're not to be shy, guys, you know? <laughs> <laughs> or it'll be a law, it's not quiet. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Dominguez, and I'm a sophomore. Uh, I would like to ask uh, if all of you guys know each other or you just met here. Or have you guys ever had, like, any work together, associate, or something like that? Um, well, Imam Hendi and I have met on, at least on one occasion, possibly on two occasions. Talk, talk about that five So, I, okay. So, um, thank you. The first, time that, the first time that I remember us meeting was in Chicago, um, uh, in part of a town called Bridgeport. Um, where there is a, a mosque known as the Mosque Foundation. Um, and this was during uh, the holy month of Ramadan, during the feast. And rep the leadership of this mosque invited uh, a number of guests from the Jewish community to come to join them for uh, the iftar, the, the daily uh, meal breaking the fast at, 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 at sundown. And uh, we, uh, uh, those of us who were guests, came to the Mosque Foundation. We were able to observe the afternoon and evening prayers. Um, and um, then we were evenly distributed at the table. So we had Jews and Muslims. I don't recall at this point whether there were representatives of the Christian community at that particular event. There were, OK. And, um, uh, you know, we, we both uh, not only shared food, which is a, um, uh, from where I sit, not only because I like to eat, but um, uh, there's something so basic and human about sharing a meal with someone, about especially someone that you don't know or that you've just met, that, uh, again, transcends um, other differences that, that one may have. And the keynote speaker at that event was uh, Imam Hendi. So um, this is an example, I think, on the part of the leadership and the members of this, um, of, of this mosque to um, welcome into their community people from other religious communities to 
um, uh, begin or to strengthen relationships. Uh, I think uh, this was a number of years ago, and I think at that time at least some members of the uh, uh, of the Muslim community were were insecure about uh, how they were viewed by their neighbors, and so this. Um, uh, th th this um, uh, effort at hospitality was a way to uh, again begin to allow people to get to know each other. And, and here I would just mention um, a, a uh, figure who is uh, revered in all three traditions, and that's the figure of Abraham, uh, for whom hospitality was one of his key uh, one of his key characteristics. Uh, um, he's, uh, the, uh, at least in the Jewish tradition, and I believe this may be in the Muslim tradition as well, uh, Abraham was known to have all four sides of his tent open so he could see strangers coming from all four directions and, and make them welcome. And so that idea of, of Abraham's tent as a place for people to meet um, and to eat uh, together is one that I think is, is very helpful. Now, I have not met uh, the bishop before. However, we have so many friends in common that we might, have, that we might as well have met. <laughs> I, I don't exactly why you're asking that question. It's a beautiful question. Maybe you saw some chemistry, some kind of easy flow here. I, um, I, um, for my undergrad, I studied Islam and first master's degree. Then when I came, then after that, the Christianity and Judaism for my graduate work. I wanted to, to confront my own misunderstanding of the other. I wanted to confront my fear of the other. But I, I truly believe, as Imam Ali, Imam Ali is a very known Muslim personality in our tradition, in our history, said, you fear that which you do not know. You fear that which you do not know. You fear Muslims when you don't know Islam and Muslims. You fear Jews when you don't know Jews. You fear Christians when you don't know Christians. So how, what do we do? Number one is to confront that ignorance of the other. And you confront it when you learn about, about, about the other. And the more you know about the other, the more you discover, wow, I did not know we have that in common. You know, not only Abraham. I speak in churches often and synagogue, and I say two-thirds of the Quran is narratives. And two-thirds of the two-thirds is the story of Moses and the story of Jesus. If you take these two stories from the Quran, the Quran will end up a few pages, really. The story of Joseph, the story of Abraham, the story of Mary. Recently, I spoke in a church and I said, Mary is mentioned in the Bible 17 times. In the Quran, 34 times. Really? I thought Mary is only Catholic. I didn't know she's Muslim too. Actually, I'm a critical of the three religions when it comes to how we talk about these figures because we talk about Abraham and we forget Sarah and Hajar and Hagar. We talk about Jesus and we forget Mary. We talk about Muhammad and we forget Khadija and Aisha and Fatima. In other words, we talk about men and we forget women. Maybe something we can work together to ensure that women will once again assume their leadership and position in our religious community. For me, that's the real challenge. So um, I'm a little older than these other two gentlemen, and as a result of that, um, we we haven't worked. To, I haven't worked together with with them specifically. But as Rabbi said, we we know so many people in common that perhaps it's almost as if we did. But I was uh, for um, for many many years. I taught for 30 years at the University of St. Thomas in uh, in the Twin Cities, Minneapolis, St. Paul. And one of the things that we did, we were involved in early dialogue, especially with the Jewish community there. We had uh, developed a special um, 
Catholic Jewish Learning Center, and one of the rabbis, local rabbis from Minneapolis, uh, was the uh, founding. Um, he was the founding head of that organization, and he, he we began uh, having the rabbi teach courses in Judaism. This had never been done before. Having courses in Judaism uh, within as part of the curriculum. We also had um, a number of, because there weren't as many uh, Muslims in the Twin Cities as there are today, for example, uh, we didn't really have connections with the Muslim community until toward the end of the time that I was at the university. And there was a very good fellow who um, brought um, connection, made connections with uh, the local uh, imams, and we also then began to have courses in Islam. I think the learning thing is tremendously important, as, as both of my predecessors have mentioned to you, because it's a way in which you can begin to um, overcome those uh, elements whereby biases and prejudices can strangely reside in the, in, the, in the deep elements of one's heart. And that overcoming those elements is, to be, is the beginning of overcoming what can become a hatred. And that's one of the most frightening things, that when the heart becomes so hardened that it is unable to be able to recognize in the other what is the truth that is within them. So we have worked together in many ways, and many of the rabbis that I worked with when I was, I was a director for the uh, United States Conference of Catholic Bishops for five years, I was the director in Washington, D.C., of all of the dialogues with the uh, Ref Reformation churches of Christianity, as well as with the uh, interreligious dialogues. And we had, for example, three major national dialogues with the members of Islam, one in New York, New Jersey, one in the Middle West, and one in California. And then we had, with the Jewish community, we had two dialogues uh, that continued to go on, one with the Orthodox Union and another with the um, Hebrew Center. Uh, is, I forget now the exact... Uh, that, that, that's it, Council of Synagogues, right, thank you. So these things are, yeah, they really were very much a part of it. And I, I would just, I want to go back to something the Imam said in his talk to you about um, mentioning uh, things that um, that we forget, uh, such as the way in which a religious vision was able to have influence on science, uh, on mathematics, on logic. I mean, if you go back in and see the way in which, both in Islam and Christianity and Judaism, the enormous influence in the development of, 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 a, of a culture of learning uh, that is prized, it is, it, is, it is very much loved by all of our traditions and that is why it is so important then for you to be able to become the next generations that will be able to continue this tradition to see how rich cultures become because of the depth of people's faith. So wish you well. Thank you. After that, a documentary I advise you to watch called Three Cities of Light. And it talks about how Jews, Christians, and Muslims lived together in Spain and learned together and developed that beautiful civilization within, within Spain. It's also a book that came out a few years ago called The Case for Islamo-Christian Civilization, in which a Catholic professor, historian, talks about how Jews did not make the world on their own. Christians did not and Muslims did not. We built on each other accomplishments. And this is why we can work together and do things together. Thank you. So those are... Those are good resources for our students this year. We'll be working on a global solutions theme. And it sounds like those two resources, we'll put them up on our website. There, is, there are a couple of questions. We have about 15 more minutes, so I know that many students have prepared some questions. And I'm going to start back here and work my way up. Sorry about the lights. Hello, does this work? Uh, I'm Dia Hussein, 10th uh, grade, sophomore. 
Um, this question is about uh, Islam, and I was uh, wondering, um, well, actually I know, but after Prophet Muhammad, uh, Islam broke into a bunch of parts, you know, Sunni, Shi'i, Houthi, Ibrahimi, there's a lot of parts. But my question is, is the Shi'i Muslims, who I think you kind of mentioned that in the Middle East and Iraq there's wars, and, well, the war right now against ISIL, and it's uh, Shi'i backed up by Iran militias who are fighting and who are protecting and they're covering our ground. But what I'm saying is, um, do they have a voice in this group? Shi'i Muslims. I know, I think you're a Sunni, but we're all Muslims. We believe in one God and a Quran. But that's all my question is. When I am asked whether I am, what kind of Muslim I am, I say I am a humanitarian, Dostonian, universalist Muslim. I am Dostonian because in the Quran it says we come from dust to dust we shall be returned. So I'm Dostonian. I am a humanitarian because for me what God wants of all of us regardless of religion is to be the best representatives of God on earth. The best human beings and we do that when we become uh, a voice of justice, political justice, economic justice, and social justice, along with environmental justice. And I'm a universalist because I believe one cannot be a Muslim if one only sees the pain of Muslims. To be a Muslim, you need to see the pain of every human being and the hopes of every human being. For me, these divisions have been created or, or were created by history and social political contexts and must not divide between us in any way, shape, and form. So my friend, I am a Muslim, period. Wow. Uh, my name is Peter J. Uh, I'm a senior. Uh, my question is for the Imam. Uh, as Imams or other devoted Muslims, what are you doing in order to impact people's lives in a positive way during uh -huh. these conflicts in the Middle East? What's the question again? I'm missing the question. Um, as Imams, uh, that's how you say it, or other devoted Muslims, what are you doing in order to impact people's lives in, in a positive way during these conflicts in the Middle East? What the hell? So the question is, what are, what are you doing, what are Imams doing to uh, help solve some issues in the Middle East? Um, the, 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 the conflicts of the Middle East, the violence in the Middle East, is not the making of the Middle East only. It's the making of the international community, including those of the Middle East. And for me, therefore, I believe that the solution is an international coordination and cooperation to bring about a peaceful resolution to conflicts in the Middle East. And we, when we do that, if we do the following things, number one, end dictatorships. Number two, promote gender equality. Number three, in, invest more money on science, on education, and on health than we do on arms and on wars. And to do this, we need to engage the governments of the Middle East. Unfortunately, most of the Middle Eastern countries spend more on arms and conflicts than on education and on health. And for me, that's what imams should be, should be promoting. The other thing is, um, I'm a part of a few imams councils within the Middle East and internationally that try to engage imams or educate imams and train imams to become a voice for sanity, to become a voice for peace, to become a voice for dialogue. I'm a part of a, of a group of, of imams that try to bring Shia and Sunni Muslims together so that they can become actually brothers and sisters regardless of how they see the divine or how they interpret the scripture. And, and it's okay to interpret the scripture differently. I'm a part of the imams who talk about uh, environmental issues and the need to engage the Muslim community on more uh, environmental education. 
so I don't know if I'm answering your question, but it's really too many things, but it's not only imams. We need to engage the imams, we need to engage the politicians, we need to engage the educators, we need to engage the media. The West needs to be engaged in it, the East needs to be engaged in it. For us, for me, the disaster of the Middle East evolves from uh, misunderstanding of the true message of, of, of Islam. Islam is a religion of inclusivity. It has become a message of exclusivity by people who don't understand Islam. So for me, one of the solutions is how we can, we Muslims, recapture the true image of Islam. Re, uh, uh, recapture the true message of Islam, a message of peace and love and compassion. However, it is taught by people who don't understand mercy, who don't understand peace, and do not preach peace, love, or compassion. There's a, another question. I again apologize about the lights, but please introduce yourself. Me. Um, my name is Benjamin. I'm a, I'm a senior. Uh, I got a question for you all. And do you guys all believe in the same God? And another question is that since you said religion is for peace, how does the concept of jihad fall under that? Well, I'll let you answer the question about jihad. <laughs> um, though I, would I could take a stab at that. Um, I think that, um, you know, the question of do we believe in the same God, um, I'm going to give you what it might be a typical Jewish answer, and that is yes and no. Okay. <laughs> I'm done. Um, <laughs> Let, let me let me uh, let me try to, to tease that out a little bit, um, and here I'm I'm speaking from my particular perspective as as a Jew, and and my colleagues will correct me or you know according to their own perspective. So I, I don't by any means uh, 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 want to try to speak for a tradition of which I am not a representative. That having been said. My understanding is that uh, Jews, Christians, and Muslims are all monotheists. That is, we all believe in one God. We believe in one God who uh, created, sustains, and ultimately will redeem uh, the world. Now, if you want to dig down into differences between different kinds of Jews and Muslims and Christians, you'll find all sorts of you know, nuances of that, but um, uh, that is certainly uh, something that uh, all three traditions share. Um, Jews and Christians both consider the uh, Torah and the rest of the Old Testament to be sacred scripture. Um, uh, uh, Islam reveres those books, but is a little bit different in its approach to whether they are sacred scripture. And I'll, again, I'll leave that to you to, to nuance that uh, for me. Um, we uh, go into more specifics. The Imam has mentioned the importance of, of Abraham and Moses and Joseph and Sarah and Hagar and, and, and um, Jesus and Mary. So. There are many things about who we think God is and what we think God does and what we think God expects of us where there is a great deal of overlap. If we all agreed 100% on everything that God did and God expects of us, then we wouldn't have three separate traditions. So there are uh, differences, um, and this is why I say sort of yes uh, and no. I tend to think that the similarities, and especially the simile, especially the ethical and moral uh, 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 aspects that flow from that belief in the one God and what that one God does, uh, form uh, a a foundation for not only the kind of relationship we're, that we're talking about, but even more so 
the imperative for us all to work together to solve the kind of global questions that, that we're, dis we're discussing. Um, I'm tempted to, a I won't ask the question, but just think to yourselves a minute, how many Jews are there in the world? So the answer is between 13 and 14 million, as compared to, I believe, 1.4 billion, if I'm off a billion, have a point billion here or there, don't, don't, don't hold me to it, but well over a billion Catholics, well over a billion Muslims, um, uh, 700,000 um, uh, Hindus. Um, the Jews, by comparison, are a statistical error compared to all of these other traditions. We have a concept that we refer to in Hebrew as tikkun olam. We want to repair the world, recognizing that there's a lot that's wrong in this world. Some of the things that, you know, that both the violence and the, and the environmental degradation would be the, the two that I would pick on. Um, as 0.25% of the world's population, um, the Jewish community by itself is not gonna be able to repair the world or to save the world. The only way we can do that is in partnership. And it's in through that partnership, and partnership that is grounded in uh, uh, the understanding uh, that in our different ways, even if we may differ on specifics about what God may have done or do or expects of us, the commonality there is much more important and provides, the, uh, uh, provides that point of departure for us to join hands to work together to repair our world. Yeah, it's a wonderful question, and um, I must say I would agree with the rabbi in his answer, yes and no. I think one of the things that is very important um, within our traditions and, um, and is present also in other of the major world religions is the importance of human reason in relationship to understanding um, what is the cause of everything. And so, for 300 years, uh, between the 9th and 12th centuries, um, the Jewish tradition, the Muslim tradition, the Christian tradition, had uh, philosophers who were raising the questions about what is the cause of all things. And raising questions out of, basically, out of philosophy. And some of you may find this very interesting at some point to look at because it's an interesting way of beginning to see the commonality coming from reason that existed at the time of those three centuries. All the writings are, are, are linked together and the philosophical analysis of how, how, what is the cause of things and how does the, do, do humans re relate to the uh, participation in these causes and how do they become creators of good or dangerously creators of evil. So I think that the, from the religious perspective, we can say, yes, there is a way in which we uh, are related to the same God. But there are also these nuances that are very, very important that need to be maintained. For example, in Christianity, uh, we, we say, yes, the mystery of God is one God and three persons, a trinity a unity and a trinity. I mean, this is a paradox. And this is the very center of the mystery of, for Christians, what God is. But when you go to the philosophical tradition, you see the commonality is, uh, is quickly identified. And I think that um, there are so many different ways that you can begin to take that question and pursue it. And I think that if there are some of you who are very much interested in that. I think it's a very, very worthy and important way in which you can find how this unity and collaboration of for healing the world can actually begin to make sense. I would say 
we worship the same one God. However, we may understand God differently. But we are talking about the very same being. In Arabic, we say, Ilahuna Wahed. In Hebrew, Elehino Echad. Again, you do the math or the sound yourself. Elehino Ilahuna. The same word. Echad in Hebrew, Wahed in Arabic. Our Lord or our God is one. So if Jesus worshiped the Elehino Echad, the one God, so are the Christians, so are the Jews, so are the Muslims. So we are talking about the very same God. In Hebrew, God is referred to as the Rahimim. In Arabic, Rahim, the merciful God. Referred to as the creator in, English, in, 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 in Christianity and in Hebrew and in, in Judaism. So it's in Arabic, Al Khaliq, the creator the Almighty One, the One, the Beginning, the, you know, all of those attributes, we use the same ones. Melech, Malek, Malik, in Arabic, Maliki Yawmiddin, in, in Hebrew, Malik Hayom Hadin. The same words, the same phrases, the same everything. So yes, we are worshiping the very same God, the God of us all, though we may understand the mystery of God differently. Add that to the question on Jihad, Jihad is not holy war. The word jihad means to strive and to struggle for a good cause. What I am doing now is jihad. What my fellow friends here and colleagues are doing is jihad. What you are doing is jihad. Basically, you are striving for a good cause. The fact that you spent energy to come here, you're spending energy to hear to my heavy accent, by the way. I do have a heavy accent, yes. You know why? Because I learned English in Texas. <laughs> and in Texas, they don't speak English. <laughs> you know, the fact that you are striving to learn is a form of jihad. So according to Islam, according to the Quran, I am jihadist, you are jihadists, we are all jihadists because I was trying for a good cause. When you pick up yourself up and go to a charity, to a homeless shelter, when you work with Habitat for Humanity to feed the hungry, that is jihad too. Every time you do good, planting a tree is a form of jihad. Taking care of your father, your mother is a form of jihad. Jihad is not holy war in any way, shape and, and, and form. And therefore for me, Muslims have abused the term jihad, and non-Muslims have also abused the term jihad. We need to reclaim the word jihad to mean exactly what I just said. Having said so, I'm not trying to say that Islam is a pacifist religion that does not allow people to fight in self-defense. Actually, the Quran does say, Qatilu ladina yuqatilunakum in chapter 5, verse 52. It says, fight only those who fight you and do not transgress, for God loves not transgressors. So the Quran allows us, or gives us the permission to fight in self-defense, and to stop aggression and oppression, but not to uh, exercise aggression or oppression on any human being. Islam, when it allows us to fight in self-defense, still gave us <coughs> ethics and morals we have to follow even in self-defense, even when you have the right to defend yourself, you cannot by any way, shape or form, cut down a tree, poison water, burn agricultural land. You cannot attack temples or, or, or holy sites of other faiths in any way, shape and form. You cannot behead people, my God, yes, you cannot. You cannot uh, uh, disfigure the human person even after he or she is, is, is killed. You cannot burn people. You know, when, when, when I see the, the practice of burning by ISIS or ISIL, I see that the very opposite of what Islam really teaches in self-defense. For me, ISIS and ISIL are not fighting in self-defense. They are terrorists, they are extremists, they are bloody haters of civilization. And we have to see them as such. 
They do not speak for Islam. They do not speak for the Quran. They do not speak for our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be with him. Let that be known and let that be very clear. The attacks on the Christian sites that we have seen in Syria or Iraq does not speak for Islam. Prophet Muhammad, peace be with him, his wife uh, Maria was a Christian. He had a Christian wife who died a Christian. Imagine, died a Christian. And uh, when the Prophet, peace be with him, Muhammad was visited by a Christian delegation from the tribe of Bani Najran in what is now known as Aqaba or Southern Jordan, Prophet Muhammad asked them to pray the Christian way in the name of Jesus in his mosque in the city of Medina. This is how inclusive Muhammad, peace be with him, was of the Jews and of the Christians. When the Prophet, peace be with him, came to Medina, there were Jews, there were Christians, and they continued to live with him and coordinate with him in the making of what has become the Muslim, the Muslim Empire. So let's have the final word for Marianne and let's thank our... Before we do that, can I say something? My friends, the ship of a humanity is sinking. Our mother earth is sinking. Our human family is sinking. However, there is still an opportunity and a chance to save our mother earth and our human family. It does not matter who is the captain of the ship, a Jew, a Christian, a Muslim, a Buddhist, or a Hindu, or any other person. To save our human family and the ship from sinking, we need to work as shipmates. <coughs> Where every human being matters, every Jew, every Christian, every Muslim, every woman, and every man. So let us all become the shipmates to save our human family. That's the charge. That's your homework. That's your goal. That's my goal. That's our goal. Thank you. So I want to thank you all for coming here and giving us um, your undivided attention. You guys are a very incredibly respectful crowd. And I want to thank our panelists for giving us a very refreshing um, perspective of how our religions connect so much and how we can all be one, per one people together and solve issues and also open our minds to all the stereotypes we hear every day. So from our panelists and hearing from what we said, we all need to um, come together as one and find ways to take action and also break the stereotypes that each religion has with it are all the con negative connotations each religion has with it. So thank you guys so much and thank our panelists. So give our round of applause. Yeah, thank you all and I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your day.